Family Theatre presents James Cagney and Jean Cagney. From Hollywood, the Mutual Network, in cooperation with Family Theatre, presents The Redhead, starring James Cagney and Jean Cagney. Family theater's only purpose is to bring to everyone's attention a practice that must become an important part of our lives if we're to win peace for ourselves, peace for our families, and peace for the world. Family theater urges you to pray, pray together as a family. And now to our drama, The Redhead, starring James Cagney as Andy and Jean Cagney as Marie. Marie Johnson's gone away from our town. She's gone away and there are many who will mourn her. And some while mourning others who were close to them will wonder what happened to that pleasant nurse who worked so hard and did so much when things were going their worst. You see, we had an epidemic in our town and Marie, well, that's a chance that nurses take. There are many who will wonder. The newsboy who works the corner of 14th and Colfax He'll look for the familiar sight of her coming down 14th in her white Lyle stockings and blue cape with that shock of bright red hair framing the smile she always gave him. And the cashier at Schroeder's cafeteria, she'll look along the service line for her and probably resent it a little whenever someone else uses the corner table Marie had used so often. There'll be an extra copy of the Saturday Evening Post at Walgreens Drugstore from now on and an empty seat on the 815 Colfax Avenue car. The conductor, a Mr. Meehan, will wonder about her when he makes a stop at William Street, and perhaps he'll let the light change twice before he goes ahead, thinking that at any moment she might run down the steps of that big gray apartment building and be grateful that he waited. Then perhaps after a few days, he'll think she's moved away, gone to live with her parents or something, and in a way, he'll be right. She's moved away all right, but she left so much behind her in our town. If you want to know how much, ask this man. There are a lot of things he is right now, but would not be except for her. I'm coming. Oh, Dr. Johnson. Good morning, Mrs. Holder. I was so sorry to hear about your sister. What happened to her, I mean. It was such a shock to all of us. Thank you. I, I just stopped... Stop by to see about her things and I suppose make some arrangements. Of course. Now you just wait a moment. I'll get the key to her flat. We don't want you hurrying anything on our account. Where is it now? Oh, here it is. Your sister was such a lovely girl. Follow me. Thanks. I was thinking, if you'd like, I'd be glad to have her things all packed up for you. Even ship them if you want. That's very kind of you. Oh, I swear, the older I get, the steeper these stairs are. <laughs> now, let me see. This is it, 201. I've left everything just as it was. Made the bed and straightened up the kitchens all. Thank you, Mrs. Holder. And if you don't mind, uh, I'd kind of like to be alone for a little while. Of course you would. Here, Doctor, you take this key, and then you can come and go as you please. You remember now, I'll be glad to do what I can. Like my own daughter she was. Thank you very much. I may call on you. Thank you. It looked pretty much like it has always looked. Full of little things that people use to try to make an apartment feel like home. Knick-knack shelves, darlies pinned on furniture, lace curtains trying to hide the roller shades and photographs. So many photographs. The aftershots that grateful patients send to favorite nurses. He remembered the time he jokingly slipped a picture of Greta Garbo in among those aftershots. Marie had never noticed it. The picture was still there. And the phonograph. What memories there were in that old phonograph. 
Somebody shut that thing off. I thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish to propose a toast to a man who, up till today, had only one claim to fame, a beautiful sister. My friends, I toast the new physician, Dr. Andrew Richard Johnson, who on this day, through the grace of God, an easy internship, and perhaps a little cribbing on exams, <laughs> has been enrolled in the ranks of the medical profession. May he live a long, fruitful, and medicinal life. And may he, uh, may he have an anniversary party every year. <laughs> my friends, my friends, from the bottom of my heart, I thank you. And as I look from your beaming faces to the fruit punch, which my sister started off as a completely harmless beverage, <laughs> I am brought to the sudden and happy realization that some of you, who are only my dear friend tonight, may be my patients in the morning. <laughs> So I'd like to mention I'll be on call from 10 to 6 and I'll be doing business at my father's old office at City General. I thank you. <laughs> oh, good speech, Andy. Yeah, it was, was it? Say, Doug, uh, Doug, you look a little peaked. Let me see your tongue. <laughs> oh, now cut it out. <laughs> Have you seen Marie? No, but if you see her, remind her she owes me a dance. All right. Oh, uh, pardon me, miss. Uh, did you call for a doctor? Yes, but I only want one little dance with me. Well, I'm your man. Say, this is a pretty big party. You must be a very important fella. Not yet. You see, I've got a very good-looking sister. <laughs> Honey, do you mind if we don't dance? No, I don't mind. Want to talk? Yeah. Well, come on, we'll go into the kitchen. Hey, you two. I don't think this is exactly sporting of you, Andy, taking the best-looking girl here out of circulation. Oh, Doug. How about it, Marie? Isn't this our dance? A little later, Doug. I have to fix some more sandwiches. Fine, I'll help. You want to help? Is that it? And I won't take no for an answer. Well, I'll tell you how you can be really helpful. You go over there by the piano and you ask Dr. Murphy's wife to dance with you. And then you tell her to stop looking for her husband because he had to go out on an emergency call. I was supposed to tell her that, but I forgot. Now, that's how you can help. Yeah, but I... We'll have our dance later, Doug. Come on. Hey, that's not fair. Sit down. Thanks. Frightened, Andy? Oh, how'd you know? You look frightened. You shouldn't be, you know. It's a big thing, a big, big thing, and I don't like it. Oh, Andy. Well, can I say anything else? It was different in Dad's day. It was a... It was a different profession. When he started, almost every doctor was a general practitioner with a little knowledge about everything. Oh, a man would do as much as he could and nobody expected anything more. Well, why are things so different now? There are a lot of reasons. These are times of great specialization in medicine, and you know why? Because the body is too complicated for one man. No one man could keep all the necessary knowledge fresh in his mind. And my field? Mine is the most complicated field of all. Internal medicine. Then... Why did I choose it? Mm -hmm. It's where I belong. At least, I, I thought it was. Through it, I thought I could do the most for the most people. You know what I mean? I know what you mean, big brother. Well, it's, it's where I belong, but I've, I've got to be good. The best in my field. Marie, do you, uh, do you think I'll ever be as good as Dad was? You can if you try. Just work hard and you'll see. I promise you that. I guess you think, uh, you think I've lost the old zip. But Marie, I'm not afraid so much for myself as for the people who will be depending on me. Interning was something else, but this, oh, this is different. It's a lot different. What I decide can cost a life. People will be trusting me with their lives. And you'll be saving them, too. You know how many kinds of sick a person can be? Oh, don't worry about it, Andy. You'll be good. You know, a nurse hears things around a hospital the interns don't hear. And you're going to be all right. The only thing you need is self-confidence. Mm, well, just the same. Tomorrow morning, tomorrow morning, my career officially begins. So if you don't mind, in fact, even if you do mind, I'd like to appoint you my guardian angel. <laughs> if you like, Andy. It's like you say. A nurse hears things around the hospital, and the, the others will know better than I will if I'm doing a good job. Marie, don't ever let me be anything but the best. You know what I mean? I know what you mean, Andy. I promise you I'll do my best. I'll do my best. She had done her best, too. The tattered scrapbook on the end table gave proof of that. 
The last few pages had been put together with his press clippings exclusively. They weren't very big, only passing recognition of achievements. The scattered small clips in the beginning cut from the various trade journals of the profession. Then after them, larger mentions, but not so many from the medical journals as from the society pages of the paper. Hey, uh, you, you with the red hair. Oh, hi. Hey, you want to walk me to the end of the hall? Sure. I just finished with one of my younger patients. I've got to wash off some flu germs. Sure thing. You know, I stopped by your office. Thought we might have lunch together if you're not too busy. Uh, I'd like to, but I'm supposed to go to some sort of luncheon over at the Cosmopolitan. Want to come along? Not unless you can change it to Schroeder's. Or else give me a quick change and, new, and a new hairdo within the next ten minutes. You're just like the rest, expecting miracles. <laughs> we'll make it later in the week, all right? Whenever you say. Which of your children has the flu? I think his name is Johnny Leslie in 401. 401? Yeah, that's right. What about it? Well, Dr. Wallstrom's already seen him. I, I just delivered the lab reports to him. Do you want to look at the boy again? Look at him again? I, I just examined him with a simple case of influenza. He doesn't need two doctors. Why do you think I should see him again? Andy, the lab tests were for smallpox. They came back positive. Yes, the boy had had smallpox, and thanks to the very capable Dr. Wallstrom, he's fully recovered. It had been quite a blow to Andy. That incident had almost stopped him right in the middle of his social climbing. Almost, but not quite. There was a picture with the last entry in Marie's scrapbook. It was captioned, Miss Alice Everett Downey, escorted by Dr. Andrew Richard Johnson, attends the opening of the opera season at Central City. A story accompanied the picture. Oh, Marie. Hello, Andy. I was expecting someone else. Come on in, sit down. We're we'll with you in a second. Where have you been keeping yourself? I've been here. You've just been busy. Andy, uh, can that wait? This is important. Important? Important depends on where you're sitting. Take this diet I'm making out. Mrs. Angus McDougal. To Mrs. McDougal's liver, trouble's important. For two years now, our own doctor's been telling her to cut down on the tea or it's going to turn her liver into leather. Maybe she thinks the leather one would be more durable. Well, anybody who drinks 20 cups of tea a day against doctor's order deserves liver trouble. Andy, I, uh, I didn't come here to talk about Mrs. McDougal. No? No. No, I came to talk about this. Have you seen this clipping? The article in the post, yes, I've seen it. Andy, what's happening to you? This isn't like you. What are you trying to say? Once... Once you asked me to help you be the best possible doctor. Do you remember? I remember, yeah. Well, everybody in the hospital knows that this girl's father, Alice Everett Downey's father, is the city general's chief benefactor. He's also the head of the board of directors, so what does that mean? Well, don't you see? Look, you're ambitious, Andy, and that's a good thing, but you're going about it in the wrong way. Oh, wait a minute. Wait just a minute. I don't think I understand you. You think I'm romancing Alice to get the assistant directorship here? You think this is only a political gesture? Well, that's what they're all saying. And you believe it? Well, you couldn't be seriously interested in a woman who's been married three times. Please don't say that you are. Why, we're not that kind of a family. Oh, we're not. Are we? Oh, I... I don't know what to say. Well, come on, let's hear all the gossip. Let's hear what you and the rest of the world thinks about me. Oh, Andy. You think... Andy. You think I'm afraid to make the decisions. You think I'm afraid to make a diagnosis because I might make a mistake that would cost a man his life. You know... You're right. Andy, I... I'll never be the doctor Dad was because I just don't like dealing in human life. But there are plenty you do and they can have it. Yes, I'll admit I want the assistant directorship. I want it very much because hospital administration is the only phase of medicine I'm fit for. Oh, Andy, I... I'm the desperate doctor. The guy who thinks for the hospital. I'll be happy to do all my operating on a scratch pad uh... and my diagnosing in the hospital's accounting department. And the sooner, the better. Andy, I... But I'll tell you this. I'm not using anybody to get what I want. Not Alice or anyone else, and I don't need you or anyone else to run my life for me. Now, do you understand me? I... I understand. Don't worry, Andy. I won't interfere anymore. Marie? Marie, wait for me. Oh, Doug. Hi. May I eat with you? Oh, I'd love it. All right, let's take this table here. All right. Let me help you set your tray down. Oh, fine. Marie, your hands are trembling. Huh? Are you feeling all right? Oh, I'm fine, thank you. Just a little tired, that's all. I'm glad you still care. Still care? <laughs> hey, how about breakfast tomorrow morning? All right. That's a strange kind of a date. 
It's the best I can offer. They got me riding ambulances now, all night long. A full-fledged doctor in an ambulance? Yeah, scandalous, I know. But somebody's got to do it. And so many people of our sick, this new virus thing. Mm -hmm. You know, Marie, we've got the makings of a fine epidemic here in our town. I'm afraid you're right. I've been working late every night for a week. Hey, are you sure you're feeling all right, Marie? Huh? Oh, sure, just tired. But if you don't stop... <laughs> all I'll... right, all right. <laughs> we'll talk about something else. How's Andy? I, uh... I don't know. You don't know? I haven't seen him for about two weeks. Marie, what's happened to him? What's changing him? Oh, a combination of things, Doug. Old Downey's daughter? That, but there's something else, too. He says he's afraid. Afraid? Of making mistakes that might cost lives. That old bugaboo. But he's an able doctor. Oh, but with so little self-confidence. I've... I've done all I can. Which I suppose is about all anyone can do. Poor old Andy. Ambitious but uncertain, so he pours all his education and talent down the drain of hospital politics. Oh, don't say that, Doug. He'll come out of it all right. I know he will. He's just... he's just confused. I'm going to have a talk with him. Oh, Doug, I... I am. I'm going to tell him about this conversation. Maybe I can talk some sense into him. It's the least I can do for an old friend. Now? If I don't do it on my lunch hour, I won't have time for it. Well, good luck. Oh, say, Marie, about our date. I'll check with you later. Where can I find you? Ward 3A, Contagion. Contagion? <sighs> don't look so worried, Doug. You know, if you worry so much about well people, you must frighten your patients almost to death. <laughs> you go talk to Andy. I, I do wish you'd take the rest of the day off. Go home and sleep. Oh, but there's so much to do. I... Please? Well, if it'll make you feel better, I will. Good. And I'll see you at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning, then. I'll be waiting for you. Sorry, Dr. Phil, but Dr. Johnson is out. When will he be back? It's hard to say. He left for Sun Valley early this morning. Sun Valley? Doesn't he work here anymore? He went with Miss Downey. They flew down to spend the weekend with Mr. Downey. Well, that's just fine. Look, would you set up an appointment call for me for, say, 4 o'clock? That will give him time to get there. And you better place it now. I'm mad and I don't want to change my mind. Doug hadn't changed his mind, he did talk to Andy. And Andy had made the kind of mistake he'd always dreaded most. A wrong decision. He had decided to stay out his weekend. The weekend the epidemic started in our town. Mighty lucky accident, finding her the way you did, Dr. Field. We had a date for breakfast. When she didn't come out, I went in to see what was wrong. Might be too late at that. She's been pushing herself too hard. Pulse, weak, and fast. I ordered oxygen brought up. Good. Andy, Andy. He'll be here any time now, little one. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry about our date, Doug. You lie nice and quiet. You'll have plenty of time for dates. Sure. We'll make it up later. Doug, you send Andy in as soon as he gets here, won't you? You bet I will. You mustn't worry about him, Miss Johnson. You're a nurse. You know now that you have to have rest if you want to get well, don't you? He'll be here soon. He's probably out on a call. Out on a call? Well, that's right. And you know it might take a long time, so you try to rest a little bit, huh? Uh, Field. Doug. No, I'm not going anywhere. We'll be just outside the door, and the nurse is here. Now, Marie, try to rest a little. Come. <laughs> What's the matter with that brother of hers? He's on his way from Sun Valley. If he'd only come back when I'd ask him to. Sun Valley? Did he know she was sick? No. I wasn't sure she was myself. I just told him he was needed. I guess I lost my temper. Young epidemic on our hands. What was he doing in Sun Valley? He was with the hospital's chief benefactor. Politics. Well, all we can do is wait. I don't think she'll sleep until she sees him. She didn't know he was going? He left her a note at the hospital, but I sent her home early, She so. didn't get it. Well, waiting is all we can do. Just wait. Where is she, Duggar? 
I came as fast as I could. Yeah, I know. Quiet, quiet. <clears throat> Johnson, you'd better go right in. Marie, your brother is here. Andy. Right here, little sister. You're not mad at me anymore. Oh, no, I'm not mad at you. I, I didn't mean to hurt you. Please, please believe me. Hold my hand. Of course. Marie, maybe if I'd been here at the, at the hospital where I belong, maybe I could have seen this thing coming. This, and this wouldn't have... This wouldn't have... Well, I'll be all right, Andy. Don't worry about me. We'll both be all right. I should have listened to you, baby. I got off on a tangent. Lost my profession somewhere along the line. Well, we'll fix that just as soon as, just as, soon as you get well. Don't worry about it, Andy. You're good. Every bit as good as Dad was. A nurse hears things around the hospital that interns don't hear. She's in delirium. You're going to be all right, Andy. The only thing you need is self-confidence. Well, just the same. Will you go on being my guardian angel? If, if you like, Andy. And Marie... Marie, don't ever let me be anything but the best. You know what I mean? <coughs> I know what you mean, Andy. I promise you I'll do my best. I'll do my best. You'll be the finest guardian angel. That... Marie. Marie? She's asleep. Yes. She's asleep. I'm going to miss that red-headed nurse. Yes? Dr. Johnson, are you all right? Yes, sir. Yes, Mrs. Holder. Well, the hospital just called for you. The hospital? They seem quite upset. Seems you're overdue for some affair or something. Oh, yes. I'd forgotten. Thank you. I told him you'd be right over. I hope that was right. Yes, sir. Uh, it was. Thank you. And now... It gives me great pleasure to introduce another man to be honored today, a young man we've been fortunate enough to have in our midst since the beginning of his career. I am sure this will be quite a surprise to him. Ladies and gentlemen, the new assistant director of City General Hospital, the youngest man ever to hold the post, Dr. Andrew Richard Johnson. <laughs> Mr. Brogan, members of the board, doctors, ladies and gentlemen, this is really no surprise at all. In fact, I've even had time to prepare a speech. Here it is. <laughs> but if you don't mind, in fact, even if you do mind, I'm not going to read it. I've worked for this post for a long time. I've wasted most of my professional life working toward it. But now, but now I, I cannot accept the post. It's a worthy position, but it's not for me. You see, I made a promise to someone that I try all of my life to be a good doctor. I've got to keep that promise. As assistant director of City General Hospital, I would be an executive. My job would be to try to save money for the taxpayers and the benefactors. But the promise was that I'd try to save lives. I thank you for this honor, though. From the bottom of my heart, I thank you. Good speech, Andy. Then, just for an instant, Andrew Johnson thought he saw someone he knew far back in the crowd. So far back, he only saw the top of her, a spot of red. Then she was gone. That's really not so strange, though. A newsboy and a streetcar conductor both had the same experience that afternoon, but they, too, were far away. The conductor, a Mr. Meehan, smiled to himself and thought how nice it was. She really hadn't moved away at all. Now, here again are our stars, Gene and Jimmy Cagney. Thank you for your fine performances, Gene, Jimmy. 
Our thanks to Family Theater, Tony. You know, it isn't very often I get a chance to work with my little sister on the same program. A lot of fun. Then I hope you'll both be putting in another appearance uh, very soon. Just invite us. Well, consider yourselves invited. And say, while I have the two of you here, I'd like to ask you a question about the theater. Well, don't make it too hard. What is it, Tony? We'll try to answer it. Well, it's just this. What is it that makes a performance good and that makes an actor a good actor? <laughs> Generally a good part. Well, that's, uh, that's very much a matter of opinion, Tony. Jeannie, do you want to give him your opinion? Well, we think the answer is intention, Tony. Intention? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's one of the late and much-loved Walter Houston's pet theories, and I hold with him. It's a little hard to define, but you can call it an added intensiveness or a kind of grown-up, let's pretend. But it works. It works if you go into a, a part with the intention of being believed. Oh, it's hard, and it requires extra effort and time, and there's no getting away from that. But after all, the final result is worthwhile, and that's what you're interested in. Prayer is like that, too. The physical act of praying is extra effort, and it does take time. And sometimes, under some circumstances, it, it can even be hard work. But the final result is worth much more than what it costs in effort. For an example, take a family of four, two active youngsters, a father who likes to take a nap after dinner, and a mother who is right in the middle of a good book and wants to get back to it. It does require a little something in time and effort from those people to remain at the dinner table for a few added minutes to engage in the very wholesome practice of family prayer. But look at the results. Through family prayer, they invite God's richest blessing down in their home, and through prayer, they strengthen the family morally, spiritually, even physically, for it's true. The family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. From Hollywood, Family Theater has brought you The Redhead, starring James Cagney and Gene Cagney. Others in our cast were John Stevenson, Howard Culver, Pat McGeehan, and Gene Bates. The script was written by Robert Hugh O'Sullivan, with music composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman, and was directed for Family Theater by Joseph F. Mansfield. This series of Family Theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who feel the need for this type of program, by the Mutual Network, which has responded to this need, and by the hundreds of stars of stage, screen, and radio who give so unselfishly of their time and talent to appear on our Family Theater stage. To them and to you, our humble thanks. This is Tony Lofrano expressing the wish of Family Theater that the blessing of God may be upon you and your home and inviting you to join us next week when Family Theater will present The Promise, starring Elizabeth Scott, John Payne, and Bonita Granville. Join us, won't you? This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Thank you.